right, thank you. Um, I would say uh, when you're taking on a big question um, and you're the last person taking it on, <laughs> Well, I'll point to good news and bad news. I mean, the good news for all of us is that I think there's something of a consensus about where we want to go uh, with uh, conservatism more broadly and the history of intellectual conservatism um, in a more narrow sense. And so I'm not going to spend a lot of time uh, simply seconding what uh, Angus and Jennifer had to say, although I could go on uh, at length seconding all of these things they've had to say. So the bad news for me then is that um, much of what I was going to say has already been touched upon. I should note as well in starting out here that I am uh, the one person on the panel who does actually not write about um, intellectuals and conservatives. Uh, my book on J. Edgar Hoover, in fact, when I attempt to explain sometimes that I understand J. Edgar Hoover as being a conservative and being a man of ideas in a certain way, although I would not call him an intellectual, I often encounter a lot of resistance to, uh, to the idea that Hoover was anything other than a kind of power-mad, uh, vicious villain. Um, and so I think that's one of the things that I want to talk about a little bit today. What is the distinction between uh, an intellectual history of conservatism and a history of conservative ideas? So I'll get to that in a minute. Um, to start out, I wanted to say that I think it is absolutely true that we are uh, very far from where we were 15 years ago in terms of thinking about all of this. Um, and I think right now the historiography of conservatism is very strong in uh, a number of ways that have already been mentioned. One is uh, the intellectual history of conservatism, right? It has developed. Uh, Angus mentioned a number of intellectual biographies that have emerged of really critical figures about whom we knew very little. Um, and there are still other figures that I think haven't gotten the treatment they deserve, even within this world of free market thought. There is no great book on Milton Friedman, for instance. Uh, and he's just sort of waiting for all this. But nonetheless, we've come a long way um, from where we were 15 years ago. And if there is a great, great book on Milton Friedman, let me, uh, let me know, because again, maybe it's just not on my radar. I think we've also come a long way in terms of thinking about the national political story. Um, and in fact, when I talk with students about uh, the state of conservatism today, I said, do you know who the single most important politician of the 20th century was? Barry Goldwater. Um, so at any rate, in terms of thinking about the movement and uh, particularly the state of the Republican Party, how it is that the Republican Party goes through this kind of transition in the latter half of the 20th century. I think we have a very uh, serious and detailed and much more sophisticated understanding of that and of the importance of someone like Goldwater, uh, the, the greatest loser of the 20th century. Uh, the third area that we have a lot of very productive work um, is in the grassroots, right? Telling the story of kind of grassroots populist sentiment um, where that came from, the people who organized, again, particularly around the Goldwater campaign, but in other organizations and movements as well. I think we've got a very well-developed and sort of growing uh, body of knowledge there. Again, I think there are still organizations that haven't gotten the treatment that they could. Uh, the American Legion, for instance, uh, which was a great ally of J. Edgar Hoover's um, and, and, and an organization that I've grown increasingly interested in, I think we can have a more developed literature there. So there's still much more to be done. Uh, but in all three of these areas, and I would say, I guess, as a last, uh, a last component of that, I don't know uh, to what degree we want to throw this in the history of business, the history of capital and its relationship uh, to conservatism is another area uh, where a lot of energy is beginning to build. Um, but particularly in these first three areas, intellectual history, political history, and sort of the grassroots social history of conservatism, um, I think to some degree we are actually still trapped as a profession in a narrative of conservatives' own making, uh, which is to say that the vast majority of the history that has come out is history that uh, William F. Buckley might have well approved in and of himself. And when I'm talking about this with students, graduate students and undergrads, um, I talk about it as the out of the wilderness narrative, which is to say in the 1940s and 1950s, and, and you gestured to this a little bit, uh, Angan, and of course it's a very appealing story for the Mont Pelerin Society, but uh, in the 1940s and 50s, in the aftermath of the New Deal and the Second World War, a small band of activists slash intellectuals got together and said, aha, history, stop, we will turn it back, we will transform it, and that the intellectual story, the political story, the sort of high politics story, and the grassroots story really still tend to feed into this narrative, which I would argue is really a narrative of 
uh, conservatives' own making and of the conservative movement's own making. Uh, from this post-war period when you had this dissenting minority to the dominance, wherever you want to point to it, uh, usually Ronald Reagan being uh, the end point and then this period of uh, Republican slash conservative dominance that emerges. And again, do we want to talk about these as the same things? What is the movement and who's in it um, are all very useful questions. So given that we have this, um, this problem, I would say, and I'd be happy to hear that we don't have this problem, and I think a lot of the very recent scholarship is attempting to really push back against this narrative. It's one of the things that I'm trying to do uh, with the Hoover book, but I wanted to raise that as an issue, and then within that, just suggest a few quick ways that haven't come up yet in which we might think about um, broadening our view and identifying different points of study that might lead us to a very different sort of narrative. Um, the first, as I mentioned early on, is to think about, uh, I guess, less about the history of conservative intellectuals um, of the sort that George Nash wrote about. And in some ways, while people like Jennifer uh, and Angus are pushing back against Nash a little bit, I still feel, again, we're still very much uh, trapped in that framework. Uh, but to think less about a self-identified conservative intellectual tradition for neoliberal or libertarian, or, uh, but less about intellectuals than about ideas, and more about creating a genealogy of certain ideas that have been very persistent, and in fact that uh, conservative intellectuals did not invent in the 1940s. Um, some of these are, uh, well, one that's come up for me is the idea of sort of law and order politics as it emerges in mid-century uh, in the 1960s, especially as part of a kind of conservative political platform. That is a set of ideas and even a language which has a much, much longer history, and yet it's very hard to trace that out um, and to come up with an, uh, a genealogy of ideas, I suppose. Um, we might think about this in terms of anti-communism, we might think about this in terms of anti-statism, but moving away from a self-identified intellectual movement into a broader conversation about ideas, uh, where they come from, tracing those ideas, um, both breaks down our chronology, which still tends to start in 1945, 1950 or so, um, and can give us, I think, a larger set of views and a larger way to trace conservatism as a very persistent strain of 